It's been an interesting last couple of weeks, as always during the Olympics. You all see some of the the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. And all of it hinges on how well, a lot of it hinges on how well prepared the athletes have become in uh, mastering the particular sporting event that they chose to engage. And to see such discipline that went into it helps us to understand and appreciate our own race that we're running. And this race is very real. There are some things that we can learn from the physical races and the physical athletic competitions that you see around you in such events as as we're noticing these last couple of weeks in the Olympics. And you see that also in programs that our children sometimes are involved in. But what you see in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 is Paul alluding to some of those athletic events that he was witnessing and the brethren knew about in their own time. And so he made and he drew a comparison that becomes very, very practical for us. Let's start with verse 24 where Paul says, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run? But one receives the prize. Then he makes this application to Christians. Run in such a way that you may obtain it. In other words, everyone running in a race, they see themselves finishing this race and obtaining the prize. You must see yourself as a Christian running the spiritual race. And your life is this race that you're running and you'll finish when you get to the end of it. When you come to the end of your journey, that is when you die, that's the end of the race. But you have to run all the way to that point in order to obtain the prize. You can't enter this race and then... Let yourself get discouraged and quit. You must engage in some discipline, some self-discipline. So run in such a way that you may obtain it, that is, the prize. There is a prize at the end of this race, so you make sure you win that prize. Verse 25 And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. That is, they master themselves. They master their appetite. They they take on a special diet. They don't just grab up uh, greasy foods and greasy hamburgers and fries all the time. They don't go just anything. They discipline their intake. They're temperate in how they deal out the hours of their day and use them. They're temperate about making sure they get proper exercise as well as diets that match a person who's trying to reach the goal and win the prize. And so they're temperate in all things. Now, they do it. To obtain a perishable crown. We've noticed many, many people were striving to get this gold medal put around their neck. And that was everything they had disciplined themselves for. And it means so much as they stand on the podium and there's the tears coming, flowing down their cheeks because they made it. And it's a glorious, glorious moment for them. But what they got is something that's perishable. It's a perishable crown. And they do it for that because they think it's worth it. It's worth the discipline and they believe that it's worth it. And now they have that moment of glory. But it's a temporary moment. They obtain a perishable crown. But what about us? Of course, our our race is so much more important than that. And so we 
we strive for something far more glorious than a perishable crown. We for an imperishable crown, which means to us a whole lot more than winning an Olympic gold medal. For this crown is worth every moment of self-discipline that we can apply to ourselves. And so he writes in verse 26, Therefore, this is the way I run. I run this way, not with uncertainty. That is, I'm not uncertain about whether I can get the prize. I'm certain I can. No Christian, no one of us here should think I can't do this. Philippians 3 or 4 verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens. It's not on my own. On my own, I probably I know I can't. But with Christ I can. And so we believe with certainty that we can do this. It's within the grasp and within the possibility and therefore we can make it within the probability that we will make it we will win this prize and so I fight I run thus not with uncertainty and I'm not uncertain certain about the reality of the prize I know it's there because Jesus was here in the flesh and he was killed and he was raised from the dead and that showed for all time there, there is life beyond this life. And he was ascended into heaven and he's waiting there and he's urging us on. And so I'm not uncertain about the prize. It's there. It's real. And I'm not uncertain about the possibility, yea, the probability of being able to make it all the way to finish this race. And win the prize. I'm not uncertain. And Paul says, I'm not uncertain about that. You don't go, enter into an event and say, I, I probably won't win this. I probably won't make it, but I, I'm just going to try my hand at it. No, you, you go into it with some self-discipline. And the self-discipline of your mind is involved in it. Where you know that you can do this with his help. And you know he's willing to help us and he's going to be there with us to help us and we're going to make sure we're with him. But he then goes on to say, and this is the way I fight. Not as one who beats the air. That is, I don't have a real opponent to fight and I therefore just wasting my energy. I'm not going to waste my energy on something that I can't win. And I'm not going to be a Christian if I can't win this prize. But I discipline my body. And I bring that body and all of its passions and all of its uh, emotions and all that goes with this body. I bring it into subjection lest by Lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. We saw in some of the Olympic events, disqualifications take place. Some started off too soon. And if the rule is if you jump the gun, then you're eliminated. And we saw some of the athlete, uh, the athletes just hang their head and cry their hearts out because they were disqualified. They did not discipline themselves and remember the rules, and then it caught them off guard. There are a lots of different things that enter into this picture of our spiritual race. And how we can become disqualified if we do not follow the rules. So what I want us to think about now as we've read this passage and as we've analyzed it somewhat. I'd like us to think about the discipline that it's going to take us. Every one of us here has to make sure you want this prize. 
you believe this prize is real, and you're going to engage the self-discipline it will take to win this prize. So our questions now are twofold, and we'll answer these two things. Number one, we want to analyze this question. Is the prize worth the discipline? Now, we talked about those who entered into the athletic events of the Olympics and how they thought that all the discipline that they engaged, they thought that it was worth it. There won't, there won't be a single one of them standing on those podiums, either bronze, silver, or gold, who will say, it just wasn't worth it. Uh, no, they really cherish that moment, and it's really, really important to them. We have to ask this question. When we're talking about the prize that God is going to give to those who are faithful unto death, is the prize worth the discipline it takes? And if your answer is no, then you will not, you will not win the prize. I mean, you're automatically disqualified. You must believe that the prize is worth the discipline. If you start without believing in the prize and it's being worth the discipline, then you're already disqualified. You don't even enter the race to start with. Second question is, can the prize be obtained without self-discipline? Without self-discipline, the answer is obvious. The prize will not be yours. Jesus didn't die on the cross to give you an excuse not to discipline yourself and just think that you're going to float right into glory with no effort whatsoever, no self-discipline whatsoever, and that you're going to win the prize anyway. No, he didn't die so that we could float in on wings of, uh, of ease and, and uh, without fighting this fight and disciplining ourselves so can the prize be obtained? Yes. Can it be obtained without self-discipline? No. Is the price worth the discipline? The answer is obviously, if we understand the scriptures on this, and we'll look at it more closely in just a minute, is that the, the discipline, the prize is worth the discipline. We can have this prize. So let's look at first the discipline. On your screen, I notice I'm going to list a few things here. As you see on the screen, eat and drink the right things. Can you do that? Can you discipline yourself to eat right and to drink right? Can you do the right things that will discipline, that will aid you in getting yourself under control, exercising self-discipline? Well, there, there is something that we can do about our intake, what we do about the intake. What you take into your mind will either empower you or it will restri uh, restrict your ability to accomplish uh, reaching this prize. Eat and drink the right things. In John chapter 4, verse 14, Jesus with the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, uh, he points out in verse 10 that if you knew the gift of God, here's a great gift involved, and it's from God, and if you knew this gift and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. If you knew the gift of God and you really knew, understood what this meant for you because it will empower you with something very, very special and very, very strengthening. You would ask him, and he would give you living water. And this is different than water for the body. I mean, water for the body is very essential to keep the body going. But this water is for the heart. This water is for the mind. This water is for the spirit. That's from which all self-discipline takes place. Is from the heart. And it empowers you inside to drink this water. Whoever drinks this water, talking about that water in that physical well, he says he'll thirst again. 
But, verse 14, but whoever drinks of the water that I'll give him will never thirst. I mean, he will have a resource in him. The water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up to everlasting life. It is a resource that rejuvenates your spirit. And it empowers your spirit. So drink the right thing. Drink the water of life. If you don't drink it, then you're not, you don't engage the self-discipline to make the journey. And you do not empower yourself to finish the race. You've got to, you've got to discipline yourself and eat and drink the right things. Chapter 6 of John talks about, I am the bread of life. The, the picture there is, they had to pick up manna every day. Every day they picked up manna to, to nourish their physical bodies. And Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. What you'll have to do is you'll have to chew on with your mind. You'll have to chew on the things that will empower you and rejuvenate your spiritual energy. And I'm it. You, you feed on me. I'm the bread of life. And he talks about those who eat my flesh and drink my blood. What are they doing? They're learning everything they can and they're soaking it into their spirit and into their heart. Those things about Jesus that gives them power inside. And so it takes discipline on the diet. And it also takes discipline about how you exercise and whether you, whether you exercise. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 and 8, talks about those who uh, engage in bodily exercise. He says, that's, that's, that's important for your body. But really all that does is temporary because your body is still going to die. But those who exercise themselves unto godliness, now that's best for this life and the world to come. So exercise. That is, you don't just take in some facts and, and don't use it. You, you utilize that energy and put it into action. Exercise yourself unto, unto godliness. And the point is, the self-discipline that that takes to make sure you're taking in the things that you need to take into your spirit and into your heart, into your mind. You've got to have proper intake. And then you've got to use that intake. And that's exercise yourself unto godliness. The whole point of the New Testament was so that we could grow and develop properly in Christ. Ephesians 3, he prayed that they would be strengthened with all might inside themselves. Strengthened on the in, in the inner man. The, the inner you needs to have strength. In chapter 4, he says, now, he's given to you all of these things, the apostles, prophets, evangelists, and teachers, and pastors, and, and those things, he says, because these are things that help you on your intake. And then if you take this in, take all of this spiritual nourishment in, you drink it inside yourself and you try to live by it, then what you're doing is you're empowering yourself to become more like Jesus. And when you become more like Jesus, you grow up to the, to the stature of the fullness of Christ. It says he's full of Christ, that he, he, he energizes himself with the spirit of Christ. And he takes that in and he grows stronger. She grows stronger in their spiritual life. It also takes cleaning up daily. The discipline it takes to be able to clean up when we mess up. When we mess up, we clean up. I mean, that's the nature of the discipline it takes to make it to heaven. You don't just get yourself dirty and stay dirty. Hebrews chapter 10 says we've got something that can cleanse the conscience. We need that. We need, when we mess up, we need to have our conscience cleared. And we do that with the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. In 1 John 1, confessing our sins, and he's faithful and just to forgive our sins. That's, that's cleaning ourselves up on a day-to-day -day basis on a day-to-day -day basis, energizing ourselves with the water and the bread of life. If you do that, if you self-discipline yourself to make sure you do those things, then you're going to win. 
And you know day by day that you're going to win because you're empowered properly to know that. And then, of course, Philippians 3, verse 14, we remember Paul saying, I press toward the goal. I don't stop. I don't become satisfied with where I am. I don't become content with where I've arrived at this moment. I still see improvement that I've got to make. And so I press higher in the goals for myself. One of the athletes doesn't just work, wake up one day and say, I think I'm going to do the, uh, the uh, 1,500 uh, or maybe one of the more uh, strenuous things, uh, the triathlon or something of that nature. I think uh, tomorrow I'll just uh, join the Olympics and uh, I'll uh, just wait till that day arrives and then I'll just enter the, the triathlon. Now, if I did that, it would kill me first 100 yards you have to discipline yourself train yourself to grow steadily so that you're improving you can measure the improvements that you're making and what I'm saying brethren is that every one of us can do every one of those things we can we can develop a habit a self-discipline that makes sure on a day-by-day basis I'm taking in some spiritual energy I can also do this. I can think of ways to expand and improve on my spirituality. I can also make sure that when I mess up, I clean up. And then I can press for the goal. All of those things are certainly things we can do and things we must do. So first, the discipline. But now let's think about now the prize. The prize that comes at the end of the discipline, seeing him as he is. 1 John uh, chapter 3, and notice with me, starting with verse 2. 1 John chapter 3, and starting with verse 2. Beloved, now we are children of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. That is, what are we going to be when it's all said and done? But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. We're going to be changed. And we're going to be like him, for we shall see him as he is. There's going to have to be a change in us. So that when he comes, we'll be able to see him as he is. You remember, man has not been able to see the full glory of God and live. We're going to have to have a different set of eyes, a different body, to to be able to stand and see God in all of his glory. Otherwise, we would just disintegrate. We need a different body. And so we're going to see him as he is because we're going to have glorified bodies and glorified eyes to enjoy the experience. It's going to be a wonderful experience. If there is nothing else that we get out of it, that should be foremost and primary to us. I want to see the creator of the universe I mean, sometimes we can just, our jaws will drop if I saw the Grand Canyon or something like that, which is just a little small speck on this earth, or the Niagara Falls, or you can see any number of things that just really, wow. But none of that is anything compared to seeing the one who made the whole world, who made the whole universe, who made the stars, the sun, the moon, who made everything, who spread it out just to see him as he is. Isn't it worth the discipline of day-to-day drinking and eating properly, spiritual things? Isn't it worth the discipline of exercising ourselves unto godliness and pressing for that goal? certainly is. I mean, that's the most wonderful thing 
that will ever happen. And once it happens, it's not going to be over. The thrill of that victory will not subside until the next four years and then we'll have that experience again. No, it is the thrill of victory that will go on and on and on, never subsiding. Heaven, 1 Peter chapter uh, chapter 1 verse 4, look at this. Starting with verse 3, actually, he says, Beloved, or blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope. He put a, a hope that is very much alive inside us. He begot us to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. By Jesus' resurrection, I know my hope is real. I know the prize is real. It is, verse 4, to an inheritance. An inheritance, though, that is not corruptible. It's incorruptible. Isn't that wonderful? When you get an inheritance, you might spend it all up on the earth here. Or... Some brothers and sisters may fuss and fight over it and it make it an ordeal that takes the, the joy out of the inheritance. And so it's corrupted by bad behavior and bad attitudes. But this is an inheritance that won't be corrupted by any such things. There will not be anything to rob you of the wonderful nature of this experience. And there won't be a bad attitude there where somebody is resentful that you won this prize and that you made it. It's to an inheritance that is incorruptible and undefiled. Nobody can spoil it for you. And it does not fade away. Where is it? It's reserved. It's reserved in heaven for you. And so your goal now is to master yourself on the inside and exercise yourself properly with the right energy and the right resources to feed your energy level. And you can do that, but it's to win this prize. We've seen also during the Olympics where the thrill of victory was soon robbed by foolishness. The glory of winning the Olympic gold was defiled because someone did something very, very foolish. It won't be that way in heaven. They will not enter into the presence of God anything that defiles the moment, that defiles the glory. We'll enter into this and it will be undefiled forever and ever. They do it for a perishable crown. We do it for an imperishable crown and it will not be defiled by any bad attitudes and ungodliness and ungodly behavior. There's another thing though. And I think those of us who have lived in the body long, very long, sometimes you learn this very early. That your body is not ideal. You live in a body that has things that make it less enjoyable. Pains and difficulties. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, notice this passage. In talking about the resurrected body... Look at verse 42 of 1 Corinthians 15 and picture this for yourself. He says, so also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. You lay it down in the grave and it disintegrates. It's sown in corruption. But it is raised. 
in incorruption. A body that's raised in incorruption. Now that's a prize worth investing our hearts in. Look at verse 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we, the living, shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, it's going to change by the power of God. Verse 53. For this corruptible, this body we're living in with all of its aches and pains and arthritis and all the the misery that it gives us from time to time, this corruptible must put on incorruption. And this mortal, this body that's subject to dying, it must put on immortality. That is, we'll have a body that will not be subject to death and disease and hardship and difficulty. It will be an immortal body. Now, I'm going to tell you, that's worth striving for. I want that. In Romans chapter 8, Paul describes our situation now and as it will be then uh, in the resurrection. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 21. Romans 8, verse 21. Because the whole, the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption. We're enslaved, we're in bondage to a corruptible body. We just, we can't shed it. We have to live with it. We're in bondage, the bondage of corruption. But the whole creation will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Look at verse 23. And not only they, but we also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. Redemption meaning you're bought back off the slave market, the bondage of corruption. You're bought off of that market and now you're you're delivered into a body that is free of all pain and all misery and all hardship and disease. It's a body that will be glorious. In Philippians chapter 3 verse 20, Paul says this. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus, who will transform our lowly body. We've got a lowly body, but he's going to transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body. We're going to be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We're going to be transformed and conform to his body according to the working by which he's able to subdue all things to himself. Now think about the prize then. We talked about the heavenly aspect of being able to see God as he is. What a glorious thing that will be. And then on top of that to have a body that is suitable to the occasion and will be glorified in that greater land, in that greater body beyond. So... If that doesn't spark your interest, if if you can't see yourself entering into this race because you told yourself you can't, maybe you haven't looked at the prize, and maybe you haven't thought about the possibilities that the Lord has given you. Our conclusion has to be this when we bring back up the questions. It will be it will it will take self discipline to reach the prize. And you cannot have the prize without the self-discipline. But the self-discipline is energized by the Lord. And he says, I want to give you the energy. And I've got a resource for you to tap into. And you can tap into it. 
The prize is more than worth the self-discipline. And if they can do it for a perishable crown, brethren, don't lose sight of the fact that we're striving for an imperishable crown. One that we can have. And one that we know we can have. Do you believe that? Do you believe the prize is worth the self-discipline? And do you believe that you can have self-discipline that empowers you through Jesus Christ? That's where it starts. You've got to believe the prize is real. You've got to believe the prize is obtainable, that you can obtain it. And you've got to believe that you can exercise the discipline that it takes to win the prize. If you've not entered the race this morning, if you need to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ and get started in partnership with him, let me tell you how the partnership is. When you repent of your sins, you are deciding not to live the same way you have been. You're deciding to live with and for Jesus Christ. You're also deciding to empower yourself with the blessings Jesus is going to empower you with. And you know that that union takes place when your sins are washed away in baptism and you rise up united with Jesus. When you unite with Jesus, you're going to be empowered to have your sins, your guilt removed, and you can set your sight on the, the goal that's set before us. If we can help.